to reveal. Mim mimicry is when one species has evolved over time to look similar to another species for various reasons. Sometimes to discourage predators, sometimes to um, attract prey. We talked about the coral snake and the king snake. One that's very deadly, one that's not, but because it mimics the colors of the deadly snake, predators are less likely to eat it, and therefore it's an advantage for it to look like the coral snake. Which one's mimicking which? The deadly coral snake is the poisonous one. The king snake mimics it. The poisonous monarch butterfly is mimicked by the viceroy butterfly. This one is poisonous to predators, this one is not. But still, predators avoid both of them. Are poisonous to us? Do you eat any of them? No, what if it lands on No, then that's not going to affect you. But they are poisonous. What they do is monarchs eat um, milkweed. Do you know what milkweed is? No. It's a plant you probably have seen growing like on the side of the road or in the woods. And it's, it's got these sort of oval leaves. And it's got those pods. Eventually, when they mature these pods, and if you open it up, there's like seeds on those strings. If you break them open, there's like this milky sort of latex that comes out, well that stuff has poisons in it. And monarchs can eat that, then their body integrates that poison into their body, it doesn't harm them, but then they become poisonous after eating that. So, Is that like their like, main food yeah, that's, source? Yeah, their main food source so is milk So there's no monarch butterfly that may not be poisonous? Is it like this? Uh, well, it's, it, may, it can make predators of the monarch sick. So they have learned not to eat it. If someone was like life or death thing, it wouldn't really, there's not enough of it, I don't think, to affect the person. All right, this, did I tell you guys about the bee orchid? Yes. Okay, so it attracts bees um, to help pollinate. Lots of organisms mimic leaves. Okay, you can see in this leaf, these are like willow leaves. This is actually an insect. Its body's here. You can see its head is like grasping onto this branch. That's actually an insect. It is exactly shaped like those uh, willow leaves to blend in so that predators can't find it. Look at this. Look at that bug. Again, it looks like a leaf, exactly like a leaf. If it didn't look like on that leaf with different lines, I would have never seen it. Yeah, there's another example. It's a close up yeah. of it. Yeah, See, it's, its legs, its appendage have over time adapted to looking like leaves. Is that a close up or is it that big? What's that? Is it a like Yeah. Mm -hmm. is it is it like a part of its body? No, no that's, that's not a leaf, that's its body. Of the, the body is like yeah, that's part of its body. Does it fly or something? Um, no, I think they just walk. This is another catadid. Probably walk around as Okay. Uh, this is another um, organism that lives in the ocean. Okay, it looks like some plants. There's a fish that stick looks bug. like a plant. Or no, it's a fish. It's yeah. a stick bug. I thought it was a stick bug. There's another fish It looks just like a piece of seaweed when it hangs out there in the seaweed leaves. You got a toad, okay, it looks just like this leaf here. So we got lots of things, here's another fish that looks just like a plant growing out of the ground. There's a little video here about some mimicry. Uh, oh, maybe not. I like ever see those walking stick bugs. Yeah. They look just like a stick. Stick bugs. Those are cool. See if I can find that video. Oh, here it is.
that has had very different techniques and adaptations equally effective for catching their food. Whether you're in the forest or in the water, camouflage and stealth are among the best strategies. So that leaf fish mimics that dead leaf and then obviously can uh, pretty easily catch its prey. All right, let's just look at these last couple slides here. So if we think about these adaptations, we said that in evolution, in natural selection, there's survival of the fittest. And so the question is, well, what does that mean? What are the fittest? Well, if you look at this chart here, shows you various fur color of mice. Black, tan, black and tan together, or cream. Tells you how long they lived, how many babies they had, and tells you how fast they were, they were able to run. So in on this one, which one would you say? Which was the fittest? Daniel? The tan one? Why, what made you say that? Because I had the most babies. Okay, had the most babies. And in evolution, reproducing, passing genes on the offspring is the ultimate goal of all species. Is it the fastest? Mm -hmm. No, not the fastest, but that's okay. Um, because it was able to produce the most offspring. Okay? And so, if more of these tan mice were born, over time you would expect that the tan colored ones would become more common. Now things can be a little bit more complicated than that. Let's think about these lions, for example. So, another definition of fitness is those that have the ability to survive and produce offspring who also can survive and reproduce. So if we have four different lions here, George, Lucky, Spot, and Slick, here's how long they live, here's how many cubs they had, here's how many of their cubs survived into adulthood, and here's how big the lion is. In this example, which would you say is the most fit? <laughs> Israel, what do you think? I would say Lucky. How come? He lived the longest. He had, he had the most cubs, or she had the most cubs. And the, the well, I wouldn't say the cubs survived as long as Felix Lick's cubs. Okay. All right. That's, that's one thing to think about. Chloe, what do you think? Uh, slick. Why do you think Slick? Um, because it had more of the cubs surviving for the one. Okay. CJ, what do you think? I agree with Chloe, but it's okay. What do you, why do you think? I think because um, 
like you have to average everything out and the boat might not have lived 16 years. It lived 10, but it had, like we said, the more offspring surviving. Okay. It was one of the larger cups of Okay. So, okay. so which one is gonna um, supply the future generation with the most of its genes, Dana? Slick. Slick well. Even though Slick only lived for 10 years, Slick fathered 20 cubs, and out of those, 19 out of the 20 survived. So Slick passed down the most genes to the next generation compared to the other species, even though it lived the shortest amount of time. So that's just another example of fitness. Okay, another definition. Happens. Actually, I'm skip this one. If you have four legs and you like to gallop around, maybe you're a zebra, or a springbok, or a giraffe. Now, if you're a giraffe, why do you have such a long neck? Well, please consider the following. Now, when you watch giraffes eat, you'll see that they eat leaves up high in trees. That's what giraffes do all day. They eat trees out. Leaves that. Now, hold on one second. What's your. So, how, why do giraffes have such long necks? What would your explanation be, Tommy? Because they only eat trees. Okay. So, how do they evolve to have long necks? They didn't always have that. Yeah. Maybe uh, the food of the ground was scarce at one point, so they evolved longer necks. Because so did did some giraffes just have to reach up higher and stretch out their necks? Is that way is that the way things evolved through natural selection, Holly? They adapted to their environment. Okay. So did one giraffe stretch its neck longer and make its neck a little bit longer and so it adapted to that environment? Daniel? Okay. Is it because they needed them? Yeah. Well, what if none of them had, what if their necks were all exactly the same to begin with? Could they just stretch them out and make them eat a little bit longer each generation? That's what a lot of people think. A lot of people think, well, giraffes were always reaching up in the trees for food, and over time, their necks got longer. It's not the way it works. But there was some variation in neck length to begin with. Some giraffes happen to have a little bit longer neck, even if it's only a couple centimeters. And so those giraffes did what? Survive. Got more food, survived better, and reproduced more. And they passed on those genes to their offspring. And generation after generation, those variations can build up. So let's just watch this. And Other animals here. can't reach. They might think that if you're another animal, want to reach those high leaves, you just stretch your neck, stretch your neck, stretch, stretch, then eventually you'd be able to eat leaves up higher in trees. Well, it doesn't work that way. In order to have a slightly longer neck, you have to be born with one, just slightly long, just slightly long. So you're having a slightly longer neck, just slightly long, allows you to reach leaves that are slightly higher, slightly higher. And that gives you a slightly better chance, slightly better chance of having enough to eat, which gives you a slightly better chance, slightly better chance of having giraffe kids or uh, kids. See, it because it gives them a G. Ah, anyway, the kids with slightly longer necks, just slightly longer, have a better chance of having kids with even longer necks. And eventually, after millions of years and many, many generations, giraffes ended up with pretty long necks. This is a process of evolution by selection. Small changes with each generation. So big changes take thousands of generations, millions of years. And that's how giraffes get to have such long necks. Maybe these guys are on to something. Looks good. Thank you for joining me. I'll refer to Paul. So, guys, 
Most of the dress stretched out the necks, but some happen to be born with slightly longer necks, which get them to get slightly more food, making them slightly more likely to survive and reproduce. And over time, those changes build up until you have giraffe. So why aren't giraffe's necks 50 feet long? Okay. And there reaches a point when having a neck that's so long is no longer helpful, but starts to become harmful. So let's say some giraffes are born with necks that were too long. What happens to those giraffes? It towers above everything and it's hard to get food. Okay, and so therefore they they what? They die. They don't pass on those genes for super long necks. They're offspring. So over time, giraffes have a just perfectly sized neck. CJ? Everything's really left out on the um, um, long leg thing. What's that? The whole long leg thing. Yeah. You need to look down on Long legs, same idea. Can you stretch your legs just because you want to be taller? No. Yeah. No. Try. You can try, but it doesn't work. Alright, one more. I want to watch I want to see a little bit about the time. Did humans evolve? No, that's not the one I want. Yes, we evolved the most interesting evidence for evolution and certainly the most powerful for most people. I want you to look behind it. There is an abundance of hard evidence at the molecular, chemical, and anatomical level that evolution happens. But perhaps it's the clues hardened in stone that tell evolution's story most vividly. Here are the backbones. You can see how big these vertebrae are. The history of life is all a record in fossils, millions of them, from strata, layer by layer by layer back through time, are all interconnected. Now, partly this layering and succession is how we tell time in geology, but it's also the principal evidence that life has changed through time, life has evolved through time, that the things living today can all be connected back through time to common ancestors. These now lifeless dry rocks are gold to paleontologists. They are the puzzle pieces to the origin of one of the most powerful and majestic animals on Earth, the whale. Whales has always been a super mystery. They're like us and that they're very intelligent. They're mammals. They're uh, warm blooded. They nurse young and, and feed them milk. But they're very, very different. I mean, they live in water. They can hear in water. And they swim around like fish. So the question is this we know that mammals originally evolved on land, yet whales live in the water. How did that shift, how did that evolution happen from life on land to life in the water? That question consumes paleontologist Phil Gingrich. The evolution of whales has been his passion ever since 1978, when his team unearthed a rock in Pakistan that appeared to have a skull embedded in it. When we found it, all you could see was the brain case. Well, I thought it was a, a wolf-like animal with a very small brain. When it was cleaned, the ears were uncovered, and I could see that it had a very characteristic whale ear, and that shows us that what we have is a whale, not a wolf, not a deer, not some other kind of mammal, but a fossil whale. Do you chain the whale ancestor, Pachycetus? With only its skull as evidence, scientists do not know for sure what the rest of Pachycetus looked like, but some scientists hypothesize that it resembled a modern seal. Okay, look at this, Bill. Here's this. Paleontologists look for fossils that have transitional features from one way of life to another. They use these related forms to create a comprehensive picture of evolutionary change. 
where fossils of related species are located. Scientists organize them by their physical similarities. Sometimes these similarities don't evolve all at once, like the whale ear of Pachycetus, which lacks many other whale-like features in its backbone and limbs. Whale bodies contain inside them connections or, or clues to their past. I mean, their mammalian traits are signs of their recent history, but they're also signs of a very ancient history. Uh, take their flippers. On the outside, their flippers look like fish fins. But on the inside, the bones of that flipper are very similar to those in a monkey's arm, in the wing of a bird, and in the limb of a frog. Egypt today seems an unlikely place for Phil Gingrich to find intermediate whale fossils. This is Whale Valley in Egypt. You can see behind me there are many hills of sandstone standing above shale. What's important, it's called Valley of Whales because of whales weathering out here. This was a wide open blue sea with a full range of sea life living in it. A lot of invertebrate shellfish, sharks, about five or six kinds of whales living here. Gingrich searches for intermediates with hind limbs and feet to trace back until those feet and hind limbs are as big and fully functional as any four-footed animal that lives on land. It is a basilosaurus. Look at this. Here's the skull, incisors up front, the rest of the teeth come back to here, and the whole length of the skull is over a meter. His find, Basilosaurus, had tiny hind legs with a mobile knee and several toes, and lived 35 to 41 million years ago. Here's where scientists place this transitional form on the fossil record. The discovery of another fossil has led scientists to conclude that whales evolved from a land mammal much like this one, called synonyx. Perhaps its descendants found the water a source of abundant food and a haven from competition. Over millions of years, through variation and selection, front legs became fins, rear legs disappeared, bodies lost fur, and took on their familiar streamlined shape. Whales show us the sheer creative power of evolution. I mean, from a wolf-like creature to a whale, 10 or so million years, it is it, 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 amazing. Each dig and discovery adds more stone, more bone, more hard evidence for evolution, for the origin of life, for its history here on Earth, and for the evolutionary relationships among all forms of life. All right. Clean notes.